Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very special episode of Captive Curiosities on Our Own Devices. I'm Jean Messier, and I'm here at the Delnavert House Museum in Winnipeg having a look at some vintage audio recording and playback technology. These are Edison cylinder phonographs, and these were the first format to be commercially successful in the field of audio recording. Now, this format would have dominated the early recording industry from the 1890s until the mid-1910s, early 1920s, when it was completely superseded by the more familiar gramophone record. Now, quite some time ago, I was at a flea market and I came across a box full of Edison wax cylinders. And I bought the whole lot and thought it might be interesting to play them on camera in order to find out what sort of music the Edwardians were listening to. Now, knowing that the Delnavert House Museum had a pair of working phonographs, I called them up and they were kind enough to accommodate me and let me record in their beautiful parlor here. So we're going to be doing a number of things in this video. We're going to be discussing the development of early recording technology. We're going to look at how these two machines actually work. Uh, we're going to be playing that entire collection of wax cylinders to see what we can find on them. And we have a special treat. I will be joined by Mark Trainer, who is the director of the Delnavert Museum. And he has done a lot of research on the cultural impact of music in the Victorian era. So we will be discussing the impact that recording technologies like these had on that scene and on the culture more broadly. So lots to look forward in this video. But first, a brief prehistory of audio recording. Now, what's interesting is that the ability to record sound far predates our ability to play it back. As early as 1806, the English scientist Thomas Young of Double Slit Experiment fame conducted an experiment in which he attached a stylus to a tuning fork and then drew the stylus across a piece of smoked glass, thus recording the trace of the audio wave. About a half century later, in 1857, a French inventor named Edouard Léon de Martinville created a device known as the phonautograph, which allowed the recording of ambient sounds, including the human voice, in a similar fashion. So this consisted of a speaking horn with a thin diaphragm and a stylus, and when you spoke into the speaking horn, the diaphragm would vibrate and the stylus would etch out the pattern of the words being spoken on that smoked glass. Now, of course, you couldn't play this back. The technology didn't exist at the time. But recently, one of these recordings dated April 9th, 1860, was rediscovered and scanned, and a computer was used to reconstruct the audio. And they found that it was actually one of Martin Ville's associates singing the song Au Clair de la Lune. And previously, it had been believed that the oldest recording in existence had been made by Thomas Edison in 1877. Mary had a little lamb, its feet was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. But now we know that we actually have a recording from a full two decades earlier. So another inventor who experimented with the phonautograph was Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, although his contains something of a grisly component, an actual human ear taken from a medical cadaver. And what he did was he mounted this ear in a frame, he fixed a piece of straw to the bones of the inner ear, and then drew a piece of smoked glass across that stylus as he spoke into the ear, achieving the exact same effect as de Martinville. And this is actually pivotal in the development of the telephone because early on, Bell believed that any device for transmitting the human voice would have to pick up every component of that voice, every sub-frequency separately, multiplex all of this together, send it down one wire, and then separate it out and play each frequency separately. He thought that the human voice was very, very complex. But this showed him that any sound could be reproduced using a single waveform. And this led to the development of the practical telephone, where you have a diaphragm that picks up the sound waves, converts it into a pulsating electric signal that can be transmitted through a wire, and then reconstituted at the other end with an electromagnet and another diaphragm to reproduce the sound. Now, the next breakthrough in the development of sound recording technology was the capability of playing back the audio that was recorded. 
And this invention is typically attributed to Thomas Edison, and with good reason. But like with many inventions, a lot of different people came up with the same idea at the same time. And indeed, seven months before Thomas Edison would demonstrate his first phonograph in November 1877, a French poet and sometimes inventor Charles Coe wrote down some ideas in which he proposed engraving the sound trace onto a soft medium such as wax. You could then put the stylus back on and it would follow the trace and allow you to play back the audio. And he took these ideas, put them in an envelope, and delivered them to the French Academy of Sciences, which was the standard method for gaining primacy over an idea. But unfortunately, he didn't have the financial resources to build a working prototype. So it fell to Edison to make the first demonstration of auto recording and playback. So Edison's first phonograph consisted of a metal cylinder with a spiral groove cut into it and coated in a thin layer of tinfoil. Then you had a diaphragm and a blunt stylus and a speaking horn. And when you spoke into it, the stylus would vibrate and it would emboss the pattern of the sound waves into the surface of the tinfoil. And this vertical recording style is known as the Hill and Dale method, which would be standard for Edison phonographs for quite some time. Now, as with everything else he developed, Edison immediately tried to market this invention, uh, but it wasn't actually a success the first time round. This is because the tinfoil was very fragile, it tended to tear or wear out really quickly after only a few replayings. Uh, it was very tricky to use and the audio quality was terrible. So it only ended up selling a couple of units as you know, a curiosity at the time. It was a sensational curiosity, but still not a commercially viable system. So Edison just abandoned this idea, put it by the wayside, and moved on to other things. And it fell to others to develop the basic idea into a commercially viable audio recording format. And one of the main institutions involved in this transformation was the Volta Laboratory and Bureau, which had been set up by Alexander Graham Bell and some of his associates in Washington, D.C. And they took Edison's phonograph and improved it by replacing the tinfoil with a hard wax and replacing the embossing process with one that actually engraved the sound trace onto the wax. And this was a lot more durable and could withstand a lot more playback. Now, they also experimented with a number of other innovations, such as recording a side-to-side -side trace as opposed to a vertical one, and that would become standard on future discs, allowing you to record things like, for example, stereo sound. And they also experimented with flat discs, although we'll talk about that a little bit later. So when the Volta Laboratory had enough inventions they thought collected together, they applied for a patent, and in 1886, they started marketing their version of the phonograph, which they called the graphophone. And as soon as Edison found out about this, he immediately tried to get back into the market, and the following year launched the Edison Phonograph Company and the improved or perfected phonograph with wax cylinders. And for several years, these two companies and many others that came onto the scene sold their own proprietary cylinders in parallel. But eventually they all came to a patent sharing agreement where they all decided to standardize on a single format that was interchangeable between everybody's machines. Now, the cylinders went through a number of changes in terms of format and material over the years. So the first 1887-1888 wax cylinders from Edison were made of beeswax or stearic wax, and these tended to be a pale cream color or light beige. Uh, in 1892, they came out with the so-called brown wax cylinders, even though they actually came in a variety of different colors, including black and blue. And the dye was added to them because it was found to actually reduce surface noise, the hissing that comes from surface imperfections on the wax. Edison also experimented with a number of size formats. One of them was the concert cylinder, which was five inches in diameter and four and a half inches long. And this was intended for recording much longer performances like classical music. Uh, the standard cylinder only being able to carry around two, two and a half minutes of audio. Unfortunately, this wasn't successful because it was very expensive. Each of these cylinders cost $4, not a small amount of money in those days and the player to go with it cost a whopping $125. So it was a very short-lived format. But the problem with these early cylinders was that they really weren't durable. They were made with a very soft wax, and so they tended to wear out after very few playbacks. And so the very early machines, especially the ones that were used for home recording or for dictation machines in offices and things like that, 
actually had a little blade that once the audio recording was worn out, you could use the blade to shave off the grooves, exposing fresh wax beneath. And then you could make another recording and you could repeat this process several times until you completely removed the wax and you needed to get another cylinder. So the next material development in phonograph cylinders was made by a rival company founded by Thomas Lambert in 1900. And these are the so-called indestructible brand cylinders. And these were actually made out of celluloid, which is an early plastic on a cardboard tube core. And being made of celluloid, these were a lot more durable than the older wax cylinders that could stand up to a lot more playbacks. Now, these were introduced in 1907, and in the following year, Edison introduced his response to the indestructible cylinder, which was called the Black Amberol Cylinder. And this is made of a much harder wax than previous versions. Unfortunately, the manufacturing process wasn't perfect. Uh, these tended to shrink unevenly. They had a lot of surface noise and pitting. They sometimes cracked. It was not a great product. So in 1912, Edison introduced his own plastic cylinder, which he called the Blue Amberol. And this consisted of a distinctively blue tinted plastic on a core of plaster of Paris. And those are the cylinders that I found at the flea market that we'll be looking at today. These are all mid 1910s Blue Amberols. So Blue Amberols are widely considered to be the pinnacle of the cylinder record for a number of reasons. They were very durable, they produced high quality audio, and they also stored twice as much audio as the previous versions, four minutes as opposed to two minutes. And this was accomplished by reducing the size of the grooves to 200 threads per inch. And this actually stimulated a revival in interest in the cylinder format. But it wasn't to last long because by this time, the cylinder was really on its way out. It was being outcompeted by the flat gramophone record. And indeed, a lot of the other recording companies at the time, such as Columbia, uh, ditched the cylinder entirely for records in around 1912, 1913, leaving Edison as the sole manufacturer of cylinders. And Edison continued to produce cylinders even after it introduced its own flat record, the so-called diamond record in 1913. And interestingly enough, that was not compatible with other companies' players because Edison persisted in using the Hill and Dale recording method as opposed to the now standard lateral method. Uh, and he continued to produce cylinders for quite a few years, but these were mainly reissues of music that was originally recorded on the diamond records. This is sort of like somebody coming out with CDs, but still offering the music on vinyl for people who still have turntables and haven't bought a CD player. But by the 1920s, the cylinder had fallen completely out of fashion and had been almost completely replaced by the gramophone record. And there was a couple of different reasons for this change in format, the main one being reproducibility. In the early days, there wasn't any good way to reproduce cylinders from a master recording. So what you ended up with was the you know, very inconvenient situation of having a recording artist in the studio for hours or even days on end recording endless takes of the same song to record individual cylinders. And so no two recordings were ever the same. Later, they came up with pretty crude methods for mass producing copies. So for example, they would make a master recording and then play this on a phonograph that was connected just via the speaking horns or via rubber tubes to other phonographs and it would mechanically transfer the sound onto other cylinders. But again, the quality would degrade with each generation of recording and the master recording being made of wax would also degrade on its own. It wasn't until 1902 that Edison developed a process for creating metal molds that could be used to make multiple copies of the same recording. And this involved electro depositing a thin layer of gold onto a wax master and then depositing many layers of other metals like copper over top of this to create a solid metal mold. And then you would melt the original wax master out of the mold to just reveal the metal with the grooves molded into it. And then you could use this to stamp out as many copies as you wanted of the original recording. And the Edison company used the fact that they had gold in the process to their advantage in marketing because they called them gold molded records. And so this is what we have right here in this cylinder. But that was still kind of a cumbersome process and it was much easier to manufacture in large numbers a flat disc. Now, the invention of the gramophone disc is typically attributed to German inventor Emil Berliner, but as with any other invention, like I said before, a lot of people were experimenting with this at the same time. 
indeed, when the Volta laboratory was experimenting with the first phonograph cylinders, they were actually experimenting on the side with flat discs. And the turntables they eventually produced had the record mounted vertically rather than horizontally. And the neat reason for this is because when they were originally experimenting, they had the records mounted to the shop lathe, which of course would hold them vertically. Now, Emil Berliner came up with his idea in around 1886, but and his original idea was to have a metal disc that you would put an acid-resistant coating on, and then you would use the cutting head on the recording machine to cut through the resist, and then dunk the whole thing in an acid bath, and it would etch in the grooves to the metal. And of course, this is a horizontal or lateral engraving method, as opposed to a hill and dale method. Uh, this later evolved into directly cutting the groove into a zinc master and using that to stamp records out of hard rubber, shellac, and then later vinyl. Now, interestingly enough, Berliner had great difficulty in Germany finding funding to develop his inventions. So the very first gramophones were actually kids' toys that used records made of chocolate. So a child could buy this miniature gramophone and the little discs made out of chocolate, record some audio, play it back a couple of times, and then eat the disc, which I think is just a really neat little toy. Uh, eventually, he moved to the United States, and he managed to get financing and start the gramophone company, and through a whole bunch of betrayals and mergers and schisms and reorganizations and all sorts of corporate skullduggery, that eventually became RCA Victor, one of the greatest producers of recorded music in history. But that's a little bit beyond the scope of this video, where I wanted to really just focus on the brief heyday of the cylinder recording medium. Now, in these videos, I tend to just talk about how a technology was developed and how the technology itself works. What I tend to discuss less is the cultural impact of technologies and the impact of recorded sound was enormous. So to talk about that, let's bring in our special guest. So I am joined here by Mark Trainer, who is the director of the Delnavert Museum. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the house, its history, and uh, your role here at the museum? Sure. Uh, so Delnavert uh, uh, was built in 1895. Um, it is a, a typical upper middle class home um, uh, for uh, from that period in, in uh, Winnipeg, and it was built uh, for the uh, family of Sir Hugh John uh, MacDonald. Um, and uh, uh, Hugh John MacDonald was the son of uh, Canada's first Prime Minister, uh, John A. MacDonald, so um, he uh, was a he himself was a, a minor political uh, figure. Uh, he practiced law here in Manitoba. Um, in, in Winnipeg, and he um, he did uh, have some involvement in, in politics. Um, so uh, he was very briefly a Premier of Manitoba. He served one of the shortest terms. Um, well, as, how long uh, was that? I think it was uh, approximately six months. So <laughs> that is very uh, short. It is yeah. extremely short. Um, and he also uh, was a federal minister um, in uh, Tupper's, uh, uh, Tupper's uh, cabinet. Um, at one point as well, but his um, uh, he wasn't the political animal his father was, and uh, he was uh, less of a less inclined uh, to be in the public uh, sphere. Um, um, anyway, he raised his uh, his family here. Um, uh, he had two children, um, Daisy and Jack. Uh, Jack died as a young man um, uh, uh, as a result of uh, diabetes. Um, Hugh John uh, uh, later became a police magistrate um, and was again a, uh, uh, a popular figure and a well-known figure in Winnipeg. Um, uh, he died in 1929 and at that point uh, his wife Lady MacDonald, uh, she uh, sold the home and much of its contents and uh, downsized moving to uh, Osborne Village. Um, and. Uh, uh, the, the house then became a, a rooming house, uh, uh, mostly for uh, women uh, at that time until uh, the uh, mid-1960s, um, at which point uh, it was uh, due to be demolished, actually, to, to uh, make way for a uh, parking lot. And the Manitoba Historical Society um, managed to raise funds, step in, uh, they purchased uh, the home and it became a museum, was opened as a museum in 1974. Um, so it, 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 the museum itself um, 
uh, is less focused on uh, the McDonald's um, and really uh, uh, more focused on uh, giving visitors uh, a sense of uh, what uh, an upper middle class Victorian home would have been like um, at that time. Um, it, this was, again, it's a, a unique home in, in that it had all mod cons, uh, so uh, pipes, uh, hot water, um, it had uh, electricity. Um, so it was, um, uh, there's lots of interesting examples of, of what would have been new technologies at that mm -hmm. time uh, featuring here. So when the, the museum was restored, when it was acquired by the Mount Hope Historical Society, how, many, how much of the original fittings were in here, like in terms of the molding or what have you, how much had to be restored or rebuilt completely? Um, a, a great deal needed to be restored mm -hmm. and in some cases rebuilt. Um, the boarding house years, uh, the rooming house years, um, uh, resulted in su significant changes. So uh, as you would expect, um, uh, uh, what would have been a, a large, certainly by our standards, mm -hmm. uh, family home, um, uh, in order for that to be commercially viable, uh, these, these rooms such as this would have been uh, divided up. Mm -hmm. So uh, there would have been uh, quite a lot of uh, changes made. Uh, even the staircase itself, um, uh, it's now in its original position, but um, uh, during the rooming house years, uh, it was actually on the opposite side of the, of the hallway there. So um, quite a lot had to be rebuilt. However, there were um, uh, features that um, uh, remained intact. So, uh, for example, there's a, a speaking tube, uh, which was a means of uh, the servants communicating mm -hmm. with, the, with the family. Uh, so that was uh, uh, in place. Um, and the, 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 the structure of the building uh, itself um, was in largely in good condition. Um, um, and so uh, many of those original features were uh, simply uh, restored. So it was easy to tell what the original layout of the house was as opposed to later additions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, they, uh, there were uh, a number of uh, really useful sources from the period. So uh, when the house was um, uh, shortly after it was built in 1895, um, there were some uh, accounts in newspapers, um, sort of in social, pa uh, mm -hmm. the social pages, uh, giving quite detailed descriptions of, of the house and its, its, its features. So sources like that were, uh, were really, really useful um, when uh, uh, they came to uh, restore uh, the building. Um, uh, as well as that, uh, when Lady MacDonald uh, uh, moved from the home, um, we have uh, a copy of her, uh, the uh, auction uh, list. So mm. uh, we have a good sense of um, uh, her taste, the family's tastes. And in some cases, we do have um, uh, artifacts that did belong to the family that um, were either donated uh, by people who had acquired them at, at that time, or uh, in some cases uh, they came from the uh, uh, the, the uh, relatives of uh, of McDonald's. So quite a bit of detective work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah. Uh, I, I mean, that's and that's. Uh, I, I feel like we're still uh, on a daily basis doing detective work and finding uh, new mm -hmm. things. Uh, uh, there's always new discoveries in in a home like like this. Neat. So yeah, so we want to talk about uh, record early recording technology. So we have two rather fascinating artifacts here. So what time periods would these two have been from, yeah, these so two phonographs? So this phonograph here is older. This is from 1898. Um, this one here is a little more modern from uh, 1913. Mm -hmm. um, and so they both work on the, on the same premise and basis, um, and they both uh, will play uh, 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 wax uh, cylinders uh, uh, like we have here. Uh, this is a, an artifact in our collection, whereas uh, this uh, uh, phonograph here, uh, we, uh, 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 we use as a demonstration uh, mm. piece, so we can actually play uh, this machine. Yeah, I'm very excited to see what we'll find on those cylinders. Yeah. But yeah, but now let's talk a little bit more about the, the cultural impact of recording, because one thing we take for granted today is having recorded sound and recorded images. And this is not something that we could have for most of human history mm. where, okay, you could, rec you could write down the words of a speech. You could note down music with you know, musical notation. But you could never recreate a particular concert or a particular speech. We didn't have the sound bites. You, know, you could write down the Gettysburg Address, mm. but you have no sound bite like, you know, we will fight them on the beaches or yesterday, December 7th. Mm. So how could, can you speak to you know, the rather like the impact that would have had on people of having these 
you know, ephemeral things, these ephemeral speeches mm. sort of set in stone and also being able to hear people that are now deceased. Mm. That must have been rather spooky. Yeah, it w- I mean, it, it, it had a, a major impact almost immediately, mm. uh, both within the scientific community in terms mm-hmm. of the technology uh, mm-hmm. that, that, that uh, was evolving and, 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 and there was lots of... Uh, you know, we we think of Edison, um, mm-hmm. uh, but of of course there was many many players in 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 this sphere. Uh, in terms of the public, uh, there was um, a, a kind of great ex- excitement about it and and uh, around its potential uh, uses. Um, so um, we 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 think about its impact in terms of music, but um, almost immediately think people were thinking about things of uh, uh, more functional uses for. Um, uh, for technology such as this, so um, it was, uh, it, it, you know, it had potential for dictation. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the telephone was also yeah. uh, emerging at this time, and so um, the idea of being able to uh, record telephone conversations or messages was was significant. Um, even in terms of toys, you know, like Edison did develop a quite frankly quite frightening doll with yeah, uh, yeah. recorded yeah, exactly. sound, um, and uh, and then uh, you know. There are, uh, there were, you know, people were also interested in the fact that um, just as with photography, it allowed you to uh, uh, capture quite an accurate image of a, a deceased loved one, for mm-hmm. example, um, uh, people saw its potential in capturing the, the, the voices of loved ones or uh, famous uh, uh, or significant uh, uh, public figures. And so um, uh, it, in that regard, uh, it, 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 you know its 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 potential uses and uh, 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 its application uh, had a huge cultural uh, impact. Um, at the same time, though, it again would have been, as you say, uh, very jarring. Uh, this was the age when artificial sounds are are mm-hmm. are, uh, are beginning to kind of um, uh, 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 sort of flood uh, both public and private spaces. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if you if you were living a hundred years prior, even fifty years prior. Mm-hmm. Uh, the experience of um, uh, listening to music, of um, engaging with, um, say, significant political uh, debates or speeches uh, was was radically different. Uh, and, and so naturally enough, um, you do have uh, people who are um, suspicious um, mm-hmm. of this technology, uh, those who feel it's... Um, uh, it, it will have a negative impact on society and particularly younger people. Um, <laughs> These things have not changed. No, they? no, exactly. We always, <laughs> we're always fearing for the young. Yeah. Um, but uh, what's interesting about it uh, 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 is that it, um, uh, it, you know, it didn't uh, lead to the, the downfall of society, of course, mm. as we know. Um, and it did have, uh, uh, again, it, many of the things that we take for granted today um, can be traced back uh, to uh, the phonograph and early uh, sound recording technology. Um, but it also, in turn, uh, technology shaped culture. So music mm-hmm. itself uh, changed and evolved um, in part because of uh, uh, the, the restrictions of the technology mm-hmm. uh, required it. Which is similar to how radio would later shape it, where you know, you don't, you can't have a very long song. Your song needs to be two minutes to fit within, you know, advertising breaks and everything like that. And here you're restricted to between two and four minutes. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. So we, we think of, mm-hmm. um, you know, that for us, the kind of uh, the pop song, mm-hmm. it seems like a very natural, organic thing. You don't give too mm-hmm. much thought uh, 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 to the fact that it's, you know, two to three minutes long. Mm-hmm. Um, and so um, whereas prior to... Um, the popularity uh, dissemination of um, uh, recorded sound um, and the restrictions that we d- mm-hmm. described, um, y- there was nothing stopping a song mm-hmm. being 20 minutes long if, if, mm-hmm. if that's what it required. It also, um, I, mean, I mean, the the nuances of live music, um, they are, uh, you know, they, they, are, they are unique to how they're being played at that mm-hmm. point in time. Uh, the space in which you're listening to, to uh, mm-hmm. whether it's an instrument or human voice, whereas um, uh, uh, the recorded sound, and, and particularly as it became more and more refined, sort of standardized um, uh, performances. And, and that was, um, 
uh, again, some people were very suspicious of that and felt mm-hmm. that um, there was um, uh, uh, things were being lost in, mm-hmm. in that way. Um, and others then uh, saw the uh, potential. I mean, it meant that you could listen to um, you know the the finest performers mm-hmm. um, from all over the world in uh, in your own home, and mm-hmm. that that was uh, you know that alone had a, a massive impact. Yeah, and that's similar to other technologies of the time, giving you access to things you wouldn't ordinarily have access to, like um, stereoscopes. Yes, you give you views of the world. You could see the pyramids. You could see the Taj Mahal. You could see what you know things you would never see in your lifetime because mm-hmm. you had to be very wealthy to travel. So those sorts of things. So, yeah, so the, the the democratization of a lot of art forms, which is quite interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's um, in a sense, it, it it's uh, it, it's the timing of the development of this technology uh, and the you know growing middle class mm. in in uh, places like Canada and uh, 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 the United States and in, and in Europe, um, it, you know it, it's it's sort of perfect timing in, in a sense mm-hmm. because it's uh, 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 it's making these forms far more accessible and it's giving people an opportunity to explore um, beyond the, the kind of the local uh, mm. or even the national. Um, and that uh, that you know, so for example, jazz, um, mm-hmm. uh, jazz, without the you know um, uh, the ability to record sound, uh, jazz is a t- tremendous art form. So mm-hmm. you could imagine it would be popular regardless, but its popularity really uh, in the in the early 20th century um is uniquely linked to um uh, the phonograph yeah because it would have been a local phenomenon really it would not have spread beyond the borders of whichever cities it was being developed in that's right yeah yeah, yeah. so it, it's um uh you know it, it just has a huge kind of ripple effect in terms of how we um experience and understand music um, the other thing I think that's important to note is that um, going back to this, the kind of suspicions and fears over this technology, um, uh, prior to um, uh, the ability uh, of people to access music, uh, sound, sound recordings in this way, um, you know, there was, uh, you know, parlor music was extremely important. Mm-hmm. Um, having a musical education, particularly mm-hmm. for the middle classes and upper classes, was seen as um, uh, status uh, gave you kind of cult- cultural capital. Mm-hmm. Uh, great importance was was placed on it. Um, there was whole industries producing sheet music, um, mm-hmm. and this you know this is how if you wanted to listen to um, uh, you know music from uh, European composers, mm-hmm. for example, uh, it required you to have some ability and the ability to actually read uh, sheet music, um, and so. Um, you know, the, the one of the fears was that the, the, uh, the musical education would be undermined. Mm-hmm. Uh, young people wouldn't uh, 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 wouldn't be interested in, in learning uh, to play instruments. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, uh, that that's not uh, what what occurred. If uh, uh, in the United States, for example, uh, in the dec- decades following the the pop- popularity of the phonograph, uh, uh, the number of music music teachers um, uh, increased by twenty five percent in school. So. Again, it goes back to the the, the kind of uh, the democratization of mm-hmm. of um, forms uh, that ha- was so significant. Yeah, and then the like being able to be inspired by music forms you probably hadn't heard before. Like you know, you, there's the classic: somebody listens to a rock and roll record and they want to get a guitar immediately yes. and become a rock star. And it, you know, nothing is new under the sun. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and then even if you look at uh, music, the musical landscape nowadays, um, it's uh, at least in terms of popular music, uh, it's less, um, you know, the traditional um, m- music uh, p- uh, production companies, mm-hmm. uh, the record industry has sort of been dismantled by uh, people who can make music in their bedrooms yes. on their laptop mm-hmm. and, uh, and they can uh, disseminate that mm-hmm. and find an audience um, uh, on, on the Internet. And that's, uh, again, uh, it can be traced back to, 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 the, to, to mm-hmm. this technology. So um, yeah, it, it, it's it's um, there's a there's a degree of anarchy to, to this mm-hmm. technology. It's both destructive but incredibly creative as well. Yeah, but it's uh, like with any technology, like there are going to be technologies and cultural practices that are going to disappear. But it also creates entirely new 
cultural yeah. practices as well. Like, uh, like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and as actually, you know, as those practices disappear and even as uh, technology advances and so older forms, like we don't use wax cylinders mm -hmm. uh, anymore, but um, th that's not to say that they die entirely. Mm -hmm. um, so in the case of this, you know, you know, it's preserved in a museum, but um, records, for example, um, uh, uh, were have not disappeared. No. They're, they're, they've, there's a re revival in interest in them. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, uh, again, going back to uh, the development of actual musical forms or genres, um, genres like hip hop um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and others um, actually embrace the, uh, the, uh, that technology in terms of like sampling and mm -hmm. um, uh, a song that I should not play for my five-year-old, but he loves it. It's a it's a song by Ice T, mm -hmm. um, and it's a it's a uh, I think it's, it's fried chicken. It's called, and um, it's a it's a minute long, and it, it's sort of the lyrics are are um, sort of commenting on uh, the fact that um, the the DJ playing the, the the record, the sample that they're playing is like. Is an excellent uh, sample, but the, the 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 record itself is damaged, and they're, mm -hmm. it's, so they're getting all this crackling and and, and 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 background noise. But they they turn that that sort of uh, uh, fault um, into a an aesthetic feature of the song. Yeah, well, the the process of like scratching, doing record scratching or what have you, like that is in itself an art form, and it is a sound that has been used to create a new form of art. Yeah. So the possibility is, you know, and with recording where you're able to splice things together and create music in a way that you wouldn't have with live music. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's a lot of artists who, you know, they, they are able to layer their, their voices and everything like that, where they don't do, you know, say Enya. Enya doesn't do live concerts because she can't. Her music relies on this layering. Like her music is dependent on the ability to record and manipulate sound physically. So it's like we would not have that type of music if it weren't for that technology. She wouldn't have, she would be completely different as a live artist. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, and that, that's what's, what's really interesting. I mean, the example of Anya is, is, mm -hmm. is, is uh, a really good one because she draws on um, older Irish musical traditions, mm. but um, again, could not create the unique sounds that she uh, 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 creates mm -hmm. uh, without this technology. Um, and, and likewise, you have, um, you know, the emergence of the sound engineer and the, mm -hmm. uh, the producer as being uh, just as significant as mm -hmm. the players or the singers themselves. Um, so, you know, you know, figures like Lee Scratch Perry, again, using really fascinating samples and, and um, uh, introducing sounds that again, in the 70s, must have been really strange and shocking mm -hmm. as well. Uh, likewise, you, you look at, I don't know, bands like Steely Dan, where mm -hmm. they're trying to refine and, and purify the sound um, uh, by using the, the music, the studio mm -hmm. as an instrument, yes. you know? So it's... Um, like anybody who's, you know, fell in love with, fallen in love with a band with their albums and seen them live and said, these guys sound nothing yeah. like albums, will appreciate the role that a producer has in the creation like he's another band member absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. um and and, and and i think it i think again certain genres lend themselves uh really well uh, uh um in, in, towards you know the studio the idea of the studio as an instrument um and others don't like i think you know like folk music mm -hmm. um um you know there's a, there's a sense in in some cases that that, that uh, you lose uh, something when it's uh, mm -hmm. recorded, um, whereas you know, uh, folk music live, particularly in in the right setting, mm -hmm. is it just you can't capture that it, mm -hmm. it, um, on um, uh, by in, in recording. Yeah, and what I wonder is you were talking about before how the medium shaped the format of music, not just in length, but I'm wondering in, in terms of what instruments. Uh, or you know what sort of sounds that have been featured because the early recordings are super tinny like it cuts out Pretty much all the bass it cuts everything out. So you had to play instruments that were could be heard Yeah on this recording. So I'm wondering like uh, um, I don't know if you can speak to this But it's just an interesting thing to ponder is how the makeup of like an orchestra or like a, a Backing band or what have you would have been shaped by the fact that a lot of these instruments you can't hear them on the recording So they maybe would have been eliminated or not featured as heavily 
and you have you know a certain mix of sounds that were specifically chosen for how they showed up on the record and then by the time the technology caught up to it whether it you know it had already been set and that's the way it is because of yeah. that particular format yeah, yeah yeah i mean i think it it well one of the challenges that they had mm -hmm. um in early recordings um was i mean you know initially um there was an emphasis on uh its use um in terms of recording speeches mm -hmm. and sermons and then um uh you know, military song was mm -hmm. very popular, um, and despite it being military song, it was it was uh, largely uh, produced to dance to. Mm -hmm. um, and, but then, of course, classical music um, uh, uh, that it, it is being recorded, and you have uh, you know, like uh, you know, po really popular singers like Caruso. Um, reaching a much bigger and a, a global audience mm -hmm. um uh, a true recorded sound and and that records quite well mm -hmm. um but when you uh, come to uh trying to record an orchestra mm -hmm. they really really struggled um as you say and so um uh, having like a full orchestra um was not producing you know it, it didn't do any justice to mm -hmm. uh, to the the, the live the live sound and so again you you then uh, you find that uh, there's a refinement in terms of simplifying the number of instruments number mm -hmm. of players and so bands are beginning to change the way that we view mm -hmm. uh, uh, orchestras and then uh, bands uh, musicians playing together uh, typically are getting you know refined down to um, uh, uh, you know, s simple components like percussion, um, a string instrument, uh, singer and piano. Um, mm. So, it, yeah, again, it's changing the way that um, uh, musicians themselves um, uh, played together mm -hmm. um, and the instruments that they tended to play. Um, and, and also, in fact, the, uh, the way that they performed, because um, there's a... Uh, a term that was used at the time, the turn of the 20th, 20th century, um, like phonograph fright, um, mm. where uh, particularly singers were suddenly aware of the fact that they they were trying to uh, create a perfect mm -hmm. uh, kind of version of the song, a rendition, and so uh, that 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 resulted in people, you know, pe people singers free freezing up, um, uh, being placed on, on that kind of pressure. Interesting, yeah, and especially like in the early days where you couldn't create a master copy and then create a whole bunch of other copies, they were having to sing the same song yes. over and over and over again. And I can imagine that the pressure not only to make one recording perfect, but to make dozens. Well, yeah, exactly. Of having to hit, you know, had to hit it perfectly every time. Like when you're in a live environment, people will forgive a lot more mistakes because it's live experience, and they'll, you know, your your brain doesn't register it. There's one wrong note, but the recording, it's there forever. It's there forever, and you yeah. can keep playing mm -hmm. back, right? So, yeah. Right, so I see you have some sheet music here. So what sort of music would have been popular in the Victorian, Edwardian era? Like, what were people actually singing or playing in their parlors? And how was that impacted by the development of recorded sound? Yeah, so um, uh, parlor music and the... the the music that was typically played in in homes was actually quite diverse, um, and so forms uh, like um, like military song, um, uh, obviously uh, classical music, operetta, um, but it, again, it, it also would have included popular folk. Um, mm -hmm. It would have uh, it, it, even even early examples of of jazz. Uh, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, things like minstrel and that that sort of style of music mm -hmm. was extremely popular. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, when we think of uh, the Victorians as being, you know, sort of uptight, there were also a lot of like comedic um, oh, uh, yeah. songs and even body numbers mm -hmm. that would have been popular. So the taste would have been quite diverse, mm -hmm. and and that that's uh, you know the evidence for that is in the she music and the she music industry yeah. that was churning out all sorts okay. of genres. Oh yeah, and that, but that stereotype is really challenged by the whole music hall scene, especially yes. in uh, in the UK, you know, yeah. and that continued vaudeville and everything like that. So, you know, and I would imagine also that the the popularity of military music would have been very much stoked by the Boer War. Yes, absolutely. So yeah. you, political music and, and, and political uh, 
propaganda, if, yes. you, if you want to use a kind of strong term, mm-hmm. um, uh, that was uh, really effectively delivered uh, through uh, sheet music. So um, you have, in fact, I have some sort of pretty great examples here. This is not a political one, but this is a, a, more of a comedic one. Um, so, some of these sheet musics have like amazing um, illustrations or photographs <laughs> of them. Uh, so this one is, I really am so sleepy, uh, which I enjoy a lot. Um, um, but here we go. I've got two, I think, really nice examples, kind of contrasting examples. Mm. Um, and uh, this one here, uh, it, it, which is a, a satirical comic song that was sung by uh, Henry Clark. Um, is called When Parnell's the King of Old Ireland. So this is a, a reference to a p- period in, in Irish history. Ireland was under the dominion of the United Kingdom. Uh, it was directly ru- ruled by Parliament Westminster. Um, Parnell uh, was the leading figure in the Home Rule movement, so mm-hmm. seeking to re-establish an independent Irish uh, parliament. Um, and and this, uh, this song and, and the illustration that depicts it um, is um, s- sort of um, is an anti parliament It's oh, very subversive. That's a, uh, yes, it's exactly. Kind of a sneaky yeah. way of getting your your message. Yeah, exactly. In, yeah. Directly, yes, directly yeah. into people's homes. And so, um, uh, in contrast to that, then you have uh, another piece of sheet music. Unfortunately, it doesn't have uh, an amazing illustration mm-hmm. like this. This illustration, and I speak as an Irishman. Yeah. Uh, it's it's. I, I don't know what to say about it, but uh, uh, of course, the idea is. You know, if part if Ireland is to get home rule, anarchy will result. <laughs> uh, and I love this this um, this pig down here. But this guy that's falling over the pig very much resembles a pig himself. So yeah. you have like again, uh, uh, it's a political commentary, but there's there, there's racial mm-hmm. undertones as well. So some of some of the these political uh, this, this political sheet music can be quite. Um, uh, quite dark in, in many respects. And then in contrast to that, you have uh, Resurrection of Ireland, which was, um, again, uh, this type of sheet music w- would have been uh, more of a nationalist bent mm-hmm. and promoting the idea of of an independent Ireland. So mm-hmm. um, uh, what's kind of curious about um, uh, parlor music and, and the, the sheet music industry is that it, it is being used um, in places like uh, uh, Canada, to uh, promote the idea of the empire and the commonwealth mm-hmm. uh, and this sense of uh, um, uh, subjects in Canada being connected to, say, subjects mm-hmm. in India or in, in Ireland. Um, and so building this kind of um, uh, this uh, um, uh, uh, British or imperial, uh, uh, British imperial identity. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, uh, the, the sheet music is also being used to subvert the uh, that that empire as well mm-hmm. through the popularity of nationalist songs, so mm-hmm. um, it, it it had a a huge uh, influence beyond the sphere of the parlor itself. Yeah. So in in relation to um, uh, uh, the impact that the technology had on um, in in the kind of cultural sphere, we've talked about how it. Um, uh, how it changed uh, both uh, musical composition in terms of uh, the shortening, uh, uh, you know, the emergence of the popular song, you know, and it typically being two to three minutes. Um, uh, but it also um, uh, impacted uh, other artistic forms um, and uh, in lots of really interesting ways. Um, and an example that I, I find uh, uh, really fascinating is um, uh, its influence on an, an older technology, uh, the book, uh, the printed word. And so um, as, as uh, uh, technology like the phonograph uh, and then later radio um, uh, uh, began to um, uh, emerge as, as popular forms, um, uh, you see uh, their uh, uh, the aesthetic, you see the uh, the kind of uh, uh, function of um, of these technologies being absorbed into uh, uh, into uh, literature. Um, mm-hmm. So Joyce is a really excellent example of that. He, uh, he himself was a um, a key musician and uh, quite a, 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 an accomplished singer, um, but um, he was really interested in uh, the impacts that these technologies were having 
on uh, society and, and on uh, individuals in terms of uh, their growth and, and development. And so um, you have, uh, for example, um, his final work, fin Finnegan's Wake, which is a pretty unique book. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, that's uh, putting it mildly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and certainly a challenging one. Um, but um, what's, what's uh, central to Finnegan's Wake, um, and, and we tend to think of the um, practice of, of reading as being a solitary one. It's, mm. it's, um, uh, it, it, it's uh, of course, it does have a, a um, books and literature have a public sphere, um, but the actual act of, of reading itself is, um, is typically done um, alone um, and in one's head. Um, Finnegan's Wake is, is unique, um, uh, or is certainly unique uh, for the time, in that it, it had a, a really important aural dimension. So Joyce, again, was drawing upon uh, the uh, much older Irish traditions of, of oral uh, storytelling uh, uh, and um, uh, 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 traditions of uh, of uh, popular older popular music, where again um, uh, traveling musicians would mm. would uh, would come to homes and and uh, and sing or play yeah, balladeer uh, exactly yeah, exactly yeah. and and uh, Finnegan's Wake is, is is all about sound and and of course. Um, uh, uh, for those who've um, attempted um, to uh, to uh, read the work, um, and even those who have accomplished uh, the, the reading of the work, um, uh, it you know it's it's uh, reading it aloud is mm -hmm. is really the best way to kind of comprehend it and to to understand it. And Joyce uh, uh, felt that it was a work that was to be read aloud mm -hmm. uh, he himself um uh made uh, there was there, there are recordings of him uh reading the work and so he uh didn't see the you know the book as a as an object as a mere t material thing as being uh something that was simply put out into the world and then mm -hmm. uh, you know digested or read by uh by individuals but he saw it as as being a, you know he conceived it as a, as a much uh wider kind of cultural mm -hmm artifact and project. And so, uh, again, you have an example there of, of a, a writer who is um, uh, uh, conceiving of his work um, in uh, really unique ways, in large part because of uh, this, this type of uh, technology. Yeah, and him actually recording himself reading it is him being able to enhance the experience of, of reading this work, of experiencing this work, and he knows exactly what stresses to put on which syllables and like that. He knows exactly how to read it. And so that would be a level of immersion, a level, a degree of appreciation of the text, of experiencing the text that would not be possible without recorded sound. Because, you know, you, who's going to go over to James Joyce's house and listen to him read? He's not going to come to your house yeah. <laughs> and, and read it aloud to you so you can understand it, but you can buy a recording of it. So really, like taking the novel and using technology to enhance an older technology, rather than not supplanting it, not cheapening it, but enhancing. Yeah, you have this kind of interesting dialogue mm -hmm. dialogue between the two forms, and again, mm -hmm. the the emergence of a new form. And um, and again, you know that that uh, Joyce was equally interested in in film, and um, and we know that you know as film developed as an art form and moved from being, um, you know, it took its cues from, from theater. So it was, mm -hmm. it was initially, you know, static camera mm -hmm. and you had theater actors and, and scenery, et cetera. Yeah, exaggerated movements and things like Ex that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And as it, the technology became more sophisticated, mm -hmm. it developed its own language. Yes. And, uh, and so, you know, you look at figures like directors like uh, Eisenstein and, mm -hmm. um, and again, editing the, the, editing as a process becoming an, an art form in and of mm -hmm. itself and a way of generating meaning. So the idea being that you can uh, take uh, two images and create uh, by, by mm -hmm. splicing them together. A you montage. Create yeah. A montage, exactly. Yeah. So uh, Joyce also incorporated th these elements into his work. And so, um, a a again, technology uh, like this um, uh, doesn't just have a, a sort of an immediate direct influence on uh, sound and, and the way that mm -hmm. we listen to sound or music. Um, it, it had all sorts of ramifications for um, uh, other 
areas of of, mm -hmm. of culture, um, and and there's also the ethnographic uh, um, importance of mm -hmm. of, of um, technology such as this because um, it 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 sort of uh, allowed uh, as it both supplanted uh, certain traditions, mm -hmm. it also um, allowed uh, people to um, capture those mm -hmm. traditions before they died out. Oh, exactly. Like languages that were dying out and songs and things like that. No, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, uh, the, the influence of it is, uh, you know, again, we, we look at these things and we think they're kind of, these are just, this is old technology. There's mm -hmm. a graveyard for all, all of this old mm -hmm. technology and, or it just lives in museums. But in fact, um, uh, Although the technology itself is not in common use, its uh, uh, th its impact on, mm -hmm. uh, on our culture is, is yeah, still whatever a format it is. The ability, just like what you know, whether it's you know wet plate photography or digital photography, it's the ability to take something that was for all of human history ephemeral and fleeting and make it solid. Mm. And it's that paradigm shift. You know, it's like you know whatever means you used to do it, that's the ability to do it at all that causes a huge shift. And then you, you know, you, you've left the cave at that point. Like you know, the world will never be the same once you can take these things and make them solid and hold on to them and play with them and take something that's you know, extemporaneous and make it eternal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and it gives you that, that ability to, um, uh, to spend time with it, mm -hmm. uh, which is so important. So, you know, we, again, the, the, there was the fear that, uh, the phonograph would supplant musical education mm -hmm. um, and lead to kind of um, uh, one critic uh, felt that it would lead to like mass narcissism that people would just, you know, would just sit indoors listening to whatever they uh, mm -hmm. uh, interested them. But, you know, it, it in fact, it, it it has, you know, the, the almost the opposite effect. Mm -hmm. it, it, it actually widens. Uh, uh, this this fear of people's understanding about the world and interacting with other cultures, yeah. um, and it also, um, for example, if you were a um, if you were a young musician, uh, the ability to listen to you know the foremost mm -hmm. pianist of your of mm -hmm. your time um, repeatedly on demand mm -hmm. is you know that's that there's huge value in that um, mm -hmm. uh, it, as, a, as a learning tool and also in, in sort of the, the, the development of new styles because, you know, you know, we look at, you know, look at any great artist like Joyce, for example, mm -hmm. he, um, he certainly had his uh, influences um, and, you know, emerged from um, a, a, a really rich period in, in, in Irish culture, particularly in Irish literature. Mm. Um, but but he's also reacting against that and 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 um, and uh, having absorbed it, mm. he, he then wants to create something new himself. Uh, he, and then you go to, for example, Beckett, who mm -hmm. who would have actually been uh, one of the very lucky people to have uh, to have heard Joyce reading Finnegan's mm -hmm. Wake uh, live in his Paris apartment. Yeah. And, and and again, Beckett, you know, absorbs all of that. It's sort of a disciple of Joyce, but then moves in in. You know the opposite direction. Joyce is all about. You know, Joyce is a maximalist. You know, mm -hmm. these are big, fat, thick mm -hmm. books. And Beckett kind of uh, moves moves away to minimalism and and um, and creates something new. So um, just as just as technology um, sort of shapes and um, uh, changes, reacts to itself um, and reacts to you know economics and etc. Uh, so too does does c culture work in, in that way. So again, there's there's no, I think there's no such thing as a dead technology. No. Um, it it as long as there are humans, yes. um, the, the 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 technology will continue to kind of ripple through the way that we do things and the way that we experience mm -hmm. the world and um, and communicate with each other. Yeah. And it's interesting you're talking about the you know the fear that people would become narcissistic would become like too particular with particular types of music we see that same argument with the internet where it's like oh everybody's got their such specific niches there's no mass culture anymore mm. but what we're seeing is that's a good thing because in the past when you only had certain ways of experiencing art you know you only had a couple of tv networks you only had a couple of radio stations a whole bunch of 
artists were completely shut out because there was a popular taste. Mm. There was, you know, there's one way to experience things. There's only one thing that anybody will spend any amount of money on, only a certain amount of airtime. And so there was sort of a monolithic culture. Mm. And now with the internet, you have the ability to find whatever you want, like whatever caters to your specific case. And it means that people who create that specific type of art can reach an audience and they can create that art and they're not shut out of the, the monoculture. And I think this is the same thing here where, you know, if, you know, there's a concert hall in town. If you want to go see, listen to some music, it's only whichever band, whatever orchestras that they're booking, you have a single source mm. of that music. But if you can just buy cylinders, buy records of all the sort of music from all around the world, then yeah, you can experience more and they'll produce more of it and artists that otherwise wouldn't have been had any exposure at all. Yeah, so, exactly. so we, 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 it's cyclical. We, we always see the same fears with whatever technology is. It always ends up being the opposite. It always ends up enriching. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, again, it's that, it's that the, the paradox of both destruction and, mm -hmm. and the creation of, mm -hmm. of something new. It's, it's uh, again, we know in, from the natural world, it's, it's, it does that, mm -hmm. that in and of yes. itself is a natural phenomenon. No, absolutely. And so it's, it's quite, it's always funny that, that there, that, uh, there are these uh, either suspicions or fears or anxieties mm. over these processes um, when in fact it's unfortunately I think if you live in this universe that's that's mm. unfortunately actually yeah. because it makes it interesting and, and the negative impacts always end up being stuff they never thought about yes exactly you know, exactly you know with the, or fears about the internet turned out to be like other things entirely fears about the recording you know, nobody would have predicted you know the what the recording industry would have turned into and what it did to certain artists and you know talk about Caruso and how he became like one of the first global music superstars because of recording mm. and you know it's sort of that system that it created of superstar. I mean we saw that with List way before but in a much larger so yeah it's very difficult to predict what a technology will do but for a, a lot of these technologies they do sort of enrich our cultural landscape. Absolutely yeah. yeah. So I think uh, we should actually, you know, play some music. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. But I uh, know, thank you so much. This is this has been such a, a great experience. I like, thank you so much for your insight on this. This is sort of a dimension that I don't typically cover in my videos. So it's nice to really show how culture and technology intertwine in so many interesting ways. So just yes, thank you so much for this. Oh, thank you. And uh, to my audience, three quarks for Mr. Mark. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the joy's in. Yes. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. Let's, let's play some yeah, music. Yeah, okay. So. All right. So, yeah, let's actually go through the process of how one sets up one of these phonographs. Yeah. Okay. So, we actually have a cylinder already in here, but I can, I can take it out. So, let's pretend I've just uh, mm -hmm. nipped out and purchased yep. uh, the, whatever the hottest uh, <laughs> wax cylinder is. Uh, so, it's just going to slide onto the unit here to power it of course this is not powered by electricity mm -hmm. uh, we uh, turn the crank here and it's already pretty full so we yeah. have like a decent amount of power then we use this little contraption here to actually uh, push the needle down so um, once we uh, click this it'll release the tension on the coil mm -hmm. and uh, the cylinder will begin to spin Something to make 
wished again, and I wished and wished again that I was back in the town where I was born. There's a farm in Michigan, and I'd like to fish again in the river that flows beside the fields of waving corn.
anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and a huge thanks to Mark and the Dalnavert Museum for all their help in putting together this video. If you're interested in any of the music featured in this video, I do have full recordings. They are, to the best of my knowledge, in the public domain, so just drop me a line and I can send you whatever files you want. I'll see you next time on another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities, where we'll look at yet more fascinating historical technologies just like this one. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.